from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. All American News brings you our people's contribution to America and freedom. Miss Evelyn C. Vaughn is back in New York after 19 months overseas. She brought back many souvenirs from Tunisia, Oran, Casablanca, Bizerte, Rome, and Naples. She went over as a staff assistant and was promoted to program director, the first Negro to be promoted. She says her next program for our boys will be in Berlin. You stood all at the ripe age of 102. You must have had some interesting experiences. Tell us one of them when you were a little girl. Yes. Well, when I was a little girl in, in slave days, I always had something to do every day. Every day. I didn't have time to play very much at all. I myself was in the house for most of the time. In days like this, while we were outdoors, pulling up weeds or picking up feathers where the chickens would all make, make them through the yard, or every day. And in cloudy days, while we were in the house, they had a big pan of flan, silver pan and an old flipper, scrubbing up the floor in the big dining room where they ate. The meal. Mr. Haney, where did you live as a slave? I was sleep all the life. Where did you live? I knew where I lived, but in Washington. Where did you live before Washington? I told you. Dr. Horn. Our survey shows that the Federal Public Housing Authority has supplied 116,000 homes for Negroes. Yes, and the total cost of this housing is $464 million, which represents about 14% of all publicly financed housing. Out of all this, about one-third are temporary structures built for the war emergency with such materials as were available. These, of course, will be removed after the war. Otherwise, they would become tomorrow's slum. Yes, but there will still be 72,000 permanent homes, at least 90% of which will be available for our families at low rent. First, more low rent housing. Secondly, additional space to expand our congested neighborhoods. For this, we must get the understanding and full cooperation of local communities. Whenever the Signal Corps makes movies of a hot and heavy battle, the 92nd Infantry will be in the thick of it. Here, our boys are manning 105 millimeter howitzers and blasting away at an Italian city in the Arno Valley. The Nazis are entrenched in the foothills, but it won't be long now until this constant barrage will rout them out of their foxholes. The 92nd is making history. Meanwhile, Negro quartermaster troops move up needed supplies to the firing line. Within easy range of enemy guns, they haul up rations, gasoline, ammunition, and medical equipment. The constant barrage and the constant supply train work hand in hand to scatter the Germans. The worst is now over. Lucky guy, they have cigarettes. It was a hard fight, but we won. 
Yes, the enemy has been decisively defeated. But that's all in the day's work for the 90 seconds. And the rest period is brief. The officers of this division rose from the ranks. But the war is not over, not by a long way. There's never a dull moment, and so our boys move ahead, right on the heels of the fleeing Nazis. The signal corps of the outfit now must establish communication lines, so strings wire with the aid of a guide pole. This sort of work gets a fellow up in the world, doesn't it? This battalion is made up of technicians, electricians, linemen, and communications experts. It is through their efforts that the troops on the move are in constant touch with field headquarters. Now they search for booby traps, for the retreating Germans are always plant mine. But our lads are too smart to be caught napping. Here's one, sudden death, carefully concealed. This has to be handled like a hot pancake, and it looks like one, but looks are certainly deceiving sometimes. A whole stack of wheat. That's the powerhouse the enemy has been using. Yes, sir, the 92nd blows up everything in its way and forges ahead. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.